a very, very important town hall that we're having today. And we're very fortunate to have all the superintendents who are representing District 29. We have Superintendent Williams of Pontiac School District. We have Superintendent Swartz of Avondale School District. And we have Superintendent Hill of West Bloomfield School District, which covers the communities of uh, Kiko Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and Orchard Lake Village. Unfortunately, right now, I am in the House of Representatives and we are in session, as Senator Rosemary Bear is too. The Senate is in session as well. And we just got word from U.S. Congresswoman Haley Stevens that she has been called into a special meeting. But this is about our superintendents and them giving you an idea of how they are going to reopen the schools this fall. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jonathan, so you can moderate the a town hall because I got to go back to work. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all for being here. I'm just getting my run of show pulled up. Okay, so as we all know, Executive Order 2020-35 rescinded Executive Order 2020-65, which was relating to COVID-19. Um, and that was the order that declared the suspension of all in-person instruction for K-12 schools in the state and also addressed many big picture concerns such as testing and various deadlines. But there are still a lot of questions about what individual districts are going to be doing and what all of those decisions mean for both students and parents. Now, the order was really helpful in giving districts the information that they needed to move forward. And one of the best parts, in, in my opinion at least, and the representatives uh, too, is that it leaves room for those individual districts to make choices on students' education based on what's right for that district and right for that district's students. Now, today we're going to be discussing those district-specific plans and how each district has been coping with EO Executive Order 65 in terms of providing resources for students and families. And then we'll be taking uh, any sorts of questions that may come up from our audience. I would also like to hear the biggest issues, the biggest obstacles that are facing each individual school district and how the state can better prepare and better help districts. Uh, that when it comes to facing crises like this, maybe in the future, or even this coming. Uh, and unfortunately, let's see, have we have, Rep. Stevens did have to get called away, and it looks like Rep. Lawrence hasn't been able to come in at the moment. So with that, I will turn things over to Superintendent Williams. Could you just tell everyone which school district you're from and, and what you do? Thank you, Jonathan. My name is Kelly Williams. I am the superintendent for the Pontiac School District, and we service about 4,000 students here in the Pontiac area. We are um, definitely dealing with uncharted territory, and we have uh, come together as a community as well as, as a district to begin to talk about how first we will keep our students and educators and staff members safe as we move forward with the reopening of our schools. Um, initially, when the executive order on March 13th was issued, we were all in a panic and we did not know how this was going to look. Uh, since then, we have put a very thorough plan together to enlist our general ed population, our special ed population, and our homeless uh, students. And so um, amongst all of, as well as our ELL, amongst all of our students right now are um, third through 12th grade students have one-to-one -one, uh, Chromebooks where they are learning uh, virtually with students checking in with their teachers on a daily basis. We are monitoring their um, modules as well as their pacing guides that they are filtering through. Our K through third grade students or K through second grade students are receiving packets on a bi-weekly uh, timeframe as well as uh, the collection on a weekly time frame from the um, parents. They can either uh, photocopy what they have done or they can take a picture and send to the teacher. 
We have a hotline set up currently for NT, any uh, parent or staff member to call in for supports around technology, mental health supports, and wraparound supports. We were able to provide food for our students leading up to last week, uh, once a week where they would receive enough lunch for a full week's capacity. And so um, we, we served probably over a thousand students every week providing that service. And we were very excited because our community partners also came and volunteered to help pass the lunches out. Our bus service company stepped up and provided busing to the uh, various locations. And so, at, so far, everything is working out. We did uh, parent surveys and teacher surveys to see how the comfort level is. And right now, about 70% um, of our parents state that they are um, working through the technology issues, working through the blended learning and virtual learning. And so um, I think we're in a good place. So the reopening, uh, we just launched our proposal plan. So it's out in the community. We're receiving feedback, but we're gonna be uh, doing the two day cohort where two days, 50% um, capacity will come on Monday and Tuesday. And then the other 50% capacity will come on Wednesday and Thursday and Fridays will be our deep cleaning day. So um, that's pretty much where we are right now. And the plan is pretty thorough as far as our sanitation. We did a survey with our parents and we have about 60% uh, saying that they're comfortable with returning back to school in the fall with the plan. Well, it sounds like uh, I was wondering what the schools were planning on doing in terms of reopening. And we did just hear from the governor today that we are going to be going for in-person education. So it's good to hear that uh, Pontiac has a plan for that. Uh, Superintendent Hill uh, from West Bloomfield, how are things out there? What's your plan? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. First, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Carter for uh, hosting this town hall. I think it's important for all of our constituents to uh, hear the plans and, and know that we are moving really from a crisis mode of teaching and learning, which we all have been in since March 16th uh, into the fall where we want to be more proactive in our planning and, and have a, a much more well thought out uh, approach to what we're doing. So, so in West Bloomfield, um, similar to, to Pontiac and I'm sure Avondale, um, we, we've been very busy in, in terms of uh, meal service, uh, serving breakfasts and lunches to students in, on a twice weekly basis, seven days a week, uh, two meals a day. And, and that, that has been very successful. And we're grateful for the federal government and the state for supporting those families. Uh, because in, in this crisis situation, a lot of families uh, didn't have the means for it. And the, with the unemployment hitting and everything, it was a valuable service. On the education front, um, uh, we, we went into our, what we call a cloud learning initiative on March the 16th. And we've been in that initiative through the rest of the year. And our, our last day of school actually was yesterday. So the students are now in the process of turning in all their Chromebooks and hotspots that we've delivered. Uh, while we were in that cloud learning initiative, we were also planning for next year. Now next year in West Bloomfield, our plan is called classroom to cloud. And if you can imagine a continuum, uh, everybody wants to be face to face if the conditions are safe mm -hmm. for students and staff. And, and I need to stress that safety is of utmost importance. So we look forward to hearing from the governor's uh, back to school safely uh, task force. And, and they were talking about it today. My understanding is that we will have uh, information by the end of June. So that will give us time to plan. And so the classroom to cloud uh, framework that we develop, uh, if we can't be 100% face to face, meaning if there are social distancing requirements and, and such that uh, we can't have 100% of the students attending on any one day. Uh, similar to Pontiac, we're gonna have two days of students. Half the students will be coming on Monday and Tuesday and the other half will be remote. Then we'll flip flop that for Thursday and Friday. And, and then Wednesday will be our deep cleaning day. We'll deep clean on Wednesday and on Saturdays. Um, that, that is um, a blended learning plan. Uh, we also, we surveyed our community members. We've had over 1400 families. Uh, some of them have multiple children. So with our 5,500 students, it's a high percentage who have responded to the survey. And, and from that survey, which was conducted on May 23rd, so things could change and we will do the survey again closer to the 
uh, end of July. Uh, anyway, 30% of our family said they wanted remote learning only. Uh, and I would be willing to bet that another 30% or more want face-to-face -face only mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's hard work and, and there's conditions in our, in our families and our homes that are not conducive to at-home learning. Uh, and the parents are working, uh, the uh, hotspots or Wi-Fi isn't as dependable, et cetera. But anyway, on our, those families that desire to have uh, just remote, we're, we're having a program that we call Lakers Online. And Lakers Online is a totally remote program and, and people can register. There's an element of choice. So we want flexibility, we want choice. The families will be able to choose, do you want our face-to-face -face or blended model, or do you want to have a totally remote? And, and since 30% of our families indicated they wanted a remote, we're, we're designing that. That'll be uh, run by West Bloomfield teachers, West Bloomfield curriculum, and, and we will be uh, introducing a new learning platform, which is well beyond this conversation, but it's a more robust uh, learning management system. So it, it's a lot easier to navigate than our current one that we were in the crisis mode on. So, so we're doing all that planning. Uh, and one of the things that, that's a big concern of ours is safety. And, and along with that are the resources that are needed to offer these multiple programs. And, and I'm just hoping that the, the federal government uh, comes through with a, a re relief package for local, local and state governments and so that we do not have to be cutting our budget while we're increasing our expenses at the same time. So that's gonna be one of our largest challenges, but I, I could go on, but that sort of gives in a nutshell where we are. So. Absolutely, and we at the state level are also fingers crossed for, the, for that federal funding. And it's interesting to hear the, the plan you have, just a smidgen different from, from Pontiac's, but it's good to, good to have this conversation. Superintendent uh, Schwarz from Avondale, you're also in the call. What's the what's the plan over for Avondale School District? Oh, much much like my colleagues uh, in in the area districts, we uh, likewise you know had a very successful remote learning period uh, with having you know uh, we had different platforms that we were using you know from Google Classroom to Seesaw and amongst others. Uh, throughout the, uh, the learning period, which uh, allowed us to um, developmentally um, accommodate, you know, students where they were, you know, by grade level, uh, you know, through this remote period. We certainly have learned through this remote period how to fine tune uh, that remoteness uh, as we move into the fall, because much like West Bloomfield, as we've surveyed our parents, you know, we do have uh, not quite 30%, but probably around 20% of our population that has indicated that uh, they would like to have a remote uh, learning period, at least to start the fall. Uh, I think some, there's some intrepidation with, with uh, about that 20% for at least the first couple months uh, to see how this goes and to see if COVID, if, if there's a resurgence in COVID that is rumored to be for the fall. Uh, so there, that's, that's driving some fears uh, and, and consequently, you know, forcing families to kind of look at that as, as a continued model. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, again, how we refine that model uh, of remoteness uh, going into the fall. Uh, and likewise, you know, looking at seated uh, and much like uh, Pontiac, much like West Bloomfield, we also are looking at the, uh, the mixed days of uh, uh, within the week, although we haven't pinpointed which days uh, in which to have seated versus remote versus the deep clean. So, uh, you know, we're much in the same conversations with the same sort of planning moving forward. We are waiting to further granularize our plan depending on what the task force has come up with uh, in terms of what the requirements are, the minimum requirements uh, and what those guidelines will be. Uh, so we've sort of outlined uh, our plans, uh, but we've not granularized them as such just just yet, but we are planning for uh, students to be in school. Uh, that's the primary. Uh, our surveys indicate that well over 70% uh, of our, of our uh, surveys that we just got back a week ago said, yep, I want my students in school. Uh, I don't want them home anymore. And, and I suspect that as, as Jerry indicated, if we did the survey again in August, 
but we'd even have more so of folks wanting school to, uh, to resume as much as normal. Uh, and we know that that's necessary for the economy. Uh, we need to get kids in school uh, as much as possible to, to rejuvenate the economy. Uh, and, uh, and, and our surveys are showing that. Uh, but there will be that, that minority uh, that will again, you know, need to be prepared for, for remote learning. Uh, and much like West Bloomfield, we're looking at utilizing our own staff uh, with planning uh, and uh, sort of a refined uh, version of what we ran through in this so-called emergency period of remoteness from March until now. Um, and again, you know, we, we also are looking at our plans relative to what accommodations students will need uh, upon their return in the fall uh, with not only you know, academic needs, uh, but also the social emotional needs. And so we are now putting in, in place specific planning around how to address both those ends uh, with, you know, assessments um, and, you know, the data gathering when students get back and how we provide and structure those interventions on, on both the academic and social emotional uh, in those first few weeks of school uh, so that we can begin that whole catch up period uh, we know students are going to come to us with a lot of um, anxieties uh, in coming back to school, uh, and uh, we're working to to get prepared for that. Uh, it, it's challenging, uh, you know, because as as Jerry pointed out, with the budgets, you know, at a time when the state is looking at making historic cuts in education, and, and it's a time that we need the most money because it's the time that kids are coming to us with the most need. Certainly, following this pandemic, uh, so we're in quite a juxtaposition with, uh, you know, with funding versus need at this point in time. So, you know, as questions arise about what can the legislature do, uh, the legislature can get a budget passed that will help us to uh, not just maintain status quo, but really address the needs of these students as they come back in the fall. Well, I can say when it comes to Representative Carter for her students come first. She always looks at the student perspective when it comes to anything that comes through. Um, so we'll, when, it, uh, when we're going into this next budget cycle, we definitely will be taking into account the needs of our schools. Um, now, since we, we have about uh, some, some time left here, quite a bit, a little more than half an hour, we're gonna switch into our question and answer phase. I do see we have some questions popping in already, but if you didn't put your question into our chat box here, I, there should be a button that allows you to raise your hand. Or if you're on the phone, I see we have a call-in listener, star five will also raise your hand. Let's, let's pull up that first question we've got here. It is for Superintendent Williams. This uh, person writes that, they are not informed about the relationship between local school districts and Oakland County. Are there things that the Oakland County Executive or Oakland County Commission are doing or can do to support the Pontiac School District? Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, we have been in dialogue with uh, Commissioner Powell, as well as the state rep uh, Carter and Senator Baer, talking about the resources and the needs um, that we, we will be broaching for the 2021 school year. Uh, I have just sent them a very extensive list of our needs around resources, and um, they are going to look at the list and try to give us as much support that will be needed moving forward. Um, the list encompass uh, interventions, additional professional development for our staff, uh, more resources to ensure that when we do teach phonemic awareness to our students, we're going to need the plastic mask. So these are the scaled down details as we begin to develop our plan, as we start talking about um, busing and, and beginning to create our pacing guide that will look completely different because it will be on a two day co cohort uh, weekly for students, how that will look. And then again, we're flushing out those resources and saying, okay, this is gonna cost us additional dollars. So there's, this is a running list that will probably be, be very fluid over the next couple of weeks. And as I uh, gain more knowledge around what our needs are, I'm giving that to uh, Commissioner Powell, Senator Baer, and State Rep Carter. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. 
Our next question comes from Christopher, uh, and I'm going to throw it over to Superintendent Hill. How can churches help children learn, especially during the summer months? Are there learning packages churches can obtain to work with children? Oh, Superintendent, you're still muted. There you go. There you go. Thank, thank you for the question. And, and yes, uh, community partners, churches, and, and other uh, community service organizations, uh, are, their partnership is welcome. Uh, in our case, we are not distributing packets for the summer, but I know that Pontiac indicated in an answer that they will. And um, what, what we will be doing, we have a summer school program uh, that's set up, and it's mostly online uh, for our students that, that need that. But, but churches pr provide a, a vital link, any... Uh, uh, parishioners uh, who attend churches or synagogues or mosques are, are welcome to communicate with, with us. Uh, we have a West Bloomfield um, Association of Clergy that, that meets and, and part of our meeting is networking and taking uh, community concerns and processing those as they come in. And so that, that group is a, a vital link in the communication. A lot of what we're wanting from our community partners is to communicate uh, with their contacts within the community and uh, send any questions and concerns they have on to us. Uh, they, can, they can come to directly to me uh, in West Bloomfield, uh, gerald.hill at wbsd.org and, and we'll make, make sure that they're responded to. We also have on our website uh, a, a link called Talk To Us and, and people can go onto that link and put in comments or questions and and uh, we'll be able to respond to those. But, but really, it's, uh, we need to be partnering with people, in particular hospitals and medical personnel, uh, any kind of screening that we're going to be doing in the fall for, for COVID-19. We will have to rely on medical expertise that we don't have as educators and, and setting up uh, the, whatever the governor's um, back to learning task force comes up with. We'll, we'll need partnerships to be able to implement a lot of the safety features related to those um, guidelines. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. This next one is gonna go to Superintendent Schwarz. And it's a, it's a really important question, actually. What assistance will be provided to parents who have to work and then send their kids to school? What assistance uh, that of parents that have to work yeah, what assistance or programs are in place, at least in Avondale, for parents that have to work but um, might have to have their kids home from school that day uh, because of the, the new regimen? Well, we've got, uh, certainly there are um, various childcare opportunities that we have in the district there. Um, in terms of if, if they're gonna be in a remote situation and their parents have to work, uh, that's something that we will have to arrange with that family individually. Uh, if there's another caregiver or who, you know, who is responsible for supervising that child when, when they are at home. Um, so uh, th that would be a case by case basis with that family. So we would work out those specific arrangements. And I would like to open up that question to Superintendent Williams now as well. That is definitely a question that a lot of people have been asking. So what uh, does Pontiac have in place when it comes to parents who might have to work while their kids might have to be at home that day for school? We have an abundance of partnerships throughout the county um, and they have all stepped up. We just did a Zoom call with probably about 30 of our partners and we have over 50 enlisted um, throughout the area and they want to know how can they help. So as we started planning our reopening, we began to discuss um, with the principals as well as with our parents and teaching staff on the off days, we knew that it could be um, very challenging for parents to go to work and also have their kids, specifically the younger students at home. So what we are doing, we're going to be reaching out to our local churches, our rec center, uh, which our mayor um, Waterman is over as well as the YMCA to just begin to enlist all type of enrichment resources that we can provide to our parents and begin to develop a partnership where on those off days, the parents can actually attend and get memberships. We'll, we'll try to help fund with the memberships. Don't know about the busing, so I can't speak to that yet, 
but at least we will have some opportunities for our parents to receive the enrichment, tutorial supports, and begin to talk about how our partners can um, build cohorts on the specific days that we will need them to do that. Okay. Superintendent Hill, I'll throw it over to you now. What is the plan in West Bloomfield for working parents with this new uh, education schedule? Yes, if, if we're um, having to go to a blended learning program, we realize that um, three, out of, three out of the five days in our plan are students learning not in face-to-face -face environment. And so we have a, a child service, child care service that we will be offering to families. And, and right now it's at minimal cost. We're trying to find grants where we can offer it for uh, little or no cost, but it's about $25 a day right now per student. But those, those classrooms that we have for childcare would be set up um, so that students will have access to our remote learning opportunities as they're in childcare. And, and we have some facilities within the school district that we will be using for that, that space in a, in a separate building uh, or a separate floor of a building that, that we're using. And, and so we'll have that available. Also through the community partnerships, um, we would work with community partnerships and, and look to uh, be able to support learning in, in addition to the childcare options that are there. We realize that in order for the economy to recover, that parents have to have the flexibility and the freedom to work. And, and they, can't, they can't be tied to, not, most parents can't be tied to a schedule where they're, they're teaching uh, their children at home and working. It's not really a doable uh, situation for a lot of families. And so we're, we're looking to be able to provide the child care on the days when they're not face-to-face, -face, should that be the case. Wonderful. It sounds like all of our school districts here have a plan in place. Just uh, give your school a call if, you're, if you are running into problems with, with that. Uh, Superintendent Schwarz, we have the new question for you. This uh, Mark is wondering if you can share information about the program through Oakland Schools and Oakland County to provide nurses to school districts. So what we understand is that there is, uh, I think there are 68 nurses that are being contracted through Oakland Schools to assist uh, the 28 school districts in the county with uh, with nursing services, particularly related to COVID uh, as we start the fall. Uh, and that's greatly appreciated. Um, and that will be something that I'm sure all 28 of us will make maximum use of. Uh, certainly as students are coming back um, and, and, and addressing those needs. So what we, uh, you know, what we are going to be doing is uh, we have as part of a planning process, just how we are going to utilize those nurses. And again, we need to get a greater understanding of what their specific responsibilities are or what they contract for. Uh, and as we learn that, then we'll be able to, again, further granularize those plans. But uh, certainly it is strongly appreciated that we will have uh, nurses that will be on site. Uh, we don't know as to what type of a schedule that will be yet or how many you know, contact hours within a week that will be. Uh, none of those details have been worked out uh, with that because we had just found that out uh, at the latter part of last week uh, that this was approved. So, uh, so those plans will be coming. Uh, so we will, uh, again, we'll see what the extent of what they're allowed to do per what they've contracted for and, and move forward appropriately. But uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that we will be able to utilize them in a capacity that will help us, you know, particularly around um, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, the social distancing uh, parameters and some of the, um, uh, you know, restrictions that we'll be under, uh, that they'll be helping us with that from, from an implementa implementation standpoint, uh, it, you know, as well as from a clinical, you know, clinician standpoint uh, in each of our school buildings. So we are looking forward to that. Wonderful to hear. Okay, this next one sounds like it, it uh, could be for all three of you. So I'll start with Superintendent Williams. Would, uh, in this case, Pontiac School District be using remote assets without the COVID-19 situation? Yes, so we were, thank you. Yes, we were moving towards um, the remote learning 
uh, for our tier three students. And so uh, that was developing slowly, but we were forced to uh, aggressively approach that um, concept earlier. And uh, we were just beginning the foundational stage in regards to remote learning with um, a particular group of students in the district and we wanted to test it out. Although we do have a few students who were working remotely um, at home, whether it was due to health care issues, we had not went to this uh, extent as far as um, spreading it out over the third through 12th grade. It is working very well. Um, it does push our, our staff to think outside the box to keep the students interested and to make sure that they are willing to log in on a daily basis in a timely fashion and do their check-ins. But uh, for the most part, it has been working. We also have provided um, Wi-Fi on all of our buildings where uh, during the summer months, students can come um, to the schools. We have benches set up where they can work outside or work in their cars. We provided hotspots for uh, any family that requested when they picked up their Chromebooks um, over the uh, distribution period. And so um, we, we are, we're excited about what we were able to offer the students at this point. And moving forward, we will continue to tweak how it will look for the reopening on the off days. Wonderful. Uh, Superintendent Hill, was there any plan for remote learning before COVID came along I, over in West Bloomfield? Yeah, actually, some of our uh, high school teachers in particular were doing a blended learning model where they were doing their, uh, their, their lectures, if you will, online. And then when the students came into the classroom, they would do their lab and discussions. And, and so we had been uh, working with that. The, the other thing I think is intriguing that could be a positive coming out of this you, you know, in Michigan, we get a lot of snow and we have a lot of snow days and snow calls and, and all of that. Uh, other states have uh, implemented a plan where instead of a snow day, you have a remote learning day. And so with all the bad weather that we're faced with, uh, I, I would look for the legislature to come up with a plan that would uh, enable uh, if school districts have the capacity to, instead of calling a snow day, call it a remote learning day. And that way students learning will not stop. They can be at home, they can access online. Uh, and, and we could move forward with that. So that's one of the side benefits. Um, also uh, looking at some of the, the Laker online material that we are developing, uh, it, it's really uh, solid instruction and it gives more flexibility to some students who want to fit a course in their schedule that maybe they can't in the physical environment. And so I could see down the line having a, more of a blended uh, approach to some of the, the coursework, uh, particularly at the high school level. Very, very interesting. Uh, Superintendent Schwarz, uh, we're on to you now. And actually the, the gentleman who originally asked this question was an Avondale alumni for the class of 1946. Wow. So was there, a, was there a plan, is there a plan or was there a plan over in Avondale before COVID hit for remote learning? So we had remote learning uh, really in terms of, of um, couple of different things. One is through, uh, you know, online classes that we have at, uh, at our high school, you know, so students, you know, could have a flex schedule per se, where they could take a, uh, an online class as a seventh hour class where that class is, you know, taken at home. Uh, we also have a virtual school uh, in which, you know, students can take, you know, up to a full load of classes virtually. Um, you know, so we've been operating in that mode for several years. Uh, of having those types of options. So, uh, but this, when you're talking about a blended model, you know, where you've got some seated and mixed with some remote, you know, that's an entirely new paradigm that we have not ventured in previously. Well, this uh, COVID-19 is making us learn all sorts of things and, and, and just learn to adapt a bit, especially when it comes to, to our education system. And we are gonna go back to Superintendent Williams. This is a transportation related question. How will transportation excesses impact funding and places and spaces? It's gonna be very costly for um, all of our districts. Transportation is probably the most unnerving uh, piece of the plan that we have to unfold quite quickly. 
And we know that with um, the executive order right now, the capacity for our buses would not go over 10. So I'm hoping that in the future, that is lifted um, where we could at least do 50% capacity where the average bus holds about 70 students. Um, it will cost us for additional routes because we do want to make sure that a student that the students are six feet apart. We want to make sure that we have the partitions up for um, the bus driver and to ensure that as students enter on the bus, they have the mask on. We will be purchasing additional PPE just in case students do not have the mask and our, our transportation service company can provide the mask as students come on the bus. Um, it is going to be quite difficult with um, the expense around transporting our, our students as well as our special education population and homeless population. Thank you, Superintendent. Superintendent Hill, what is the West Bloomfield transportation plan, especially regarding uh, student space and the masks and, and busing? Uh, very, sim very similar to what um, uh, Superintendent Williams was talking about with Pontiac. Um, when you have buses that are designed for a capacity of 60 to 70 students and you're, you're told that you can only use them for 10, it's obviously very inefficient. And, and to double the routes would double the cost and we'd be driving a lot of empty buses around or you know, pretty much empty buses. One of the strategies that we're looking at doing is having families uh, register for transportation, sign up for it as opposed to assume that everybody will be taking it because some of our families will not want their students on buses and they would rather drop them off. That's gonna create a traffic uh, issue at each of our schools. So we're also looking at how, how the start times may be impacted and we might have to do some staggered kind of start times. But all of those details are, our business manager is working with our transportation director and, and we're, we're trying to determine what's the safest and, and most efficient way to get students to school. Um, and the, the, cost, the cost factor is, is a huge one. So that's all hasn't been decided yet, determined yet, but there, there's work being done on it as we speak. Thank you. Superintendent Schwarz, what's the plan in Avondale for, for transportation? Yeah, much the same. I mean, we are going the route of having parents, uh, you know, sign up for transportation, you know, much like West Bloomfield. So we have a better idea of who actually is going to use the transportation versus transporting on their own. Uh, we do know that congestion in parking lots it's bad before, it's gonna be worse now <laughs> as more folks will probably opt to drive their students uh, regardless of transportation is provided or not. Um, you know, uh, again, a lot of that is gonna be dictated by what comes out in the guidelines and requirements that we'll, we'll be bound by that we don't know yet. You know, it's the same thing with wearing of masks. Some states have passed uh, state plans where students are wearing masks and there's other states where they're saying, no kids aren't wearing the masks, but the staff is. So. Again, we, we don't know all, you know, we're still premature in terms of knowing a lot of these, these granularized details yet, uh, but in transportation is a big one and, 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 and potentially has a huge cost to it uh, in terms of how we look at, you know, how many students conceivably we can put on a bus depending on what regulations are handed down. It's definitely gonna be a, a wait and see situation. I can definitely parrot you there. It's all about making sure that students and bus drivers and other staff are as safe as possible. So that's uh, definitely something that's gonna just have to come down the pipeline as they can. Uh, Superintendent Williams, we have a question here that's gonna go to all three of you, but we'll start with Superintendent Williams. What will be in place for children who are grade advanced or behind grade requirements? So those are the resources that we are combing through right now in regards to interventions. We, we pretty much have built in interventions in our reopening schedule with the pacing guides. Students that are advanced, we um, have a specific program that we are going to um, encourage parents to explore. Our International Technology Academy uh, will be available, which is a STEM driven um, performance school. We also are building in um, various pathways for uh, careers and um, we're working with United Way, another partner, which will be bringing in communities and schools under the NAF program, which will um, service our students with 
uh, potential career pathways, uh, robotics, um, manufacturing, patient care technician, which has been in place for the last three years. And so we are expanding that to our middle school as well as uh, General Motors, which works with our elementaries and middle schools as well. So we're, we're trying to build in those partners on the two cohort days, and then also um, enlist them for the enrichment side. Wonderful to hear. Superintendent Hill, uh, what are the plans in place over in West Bloomfield for kids who might be advanced for their grade or who maybe have fallen behind because of COVID? Uh, that's a real good question. And uh, again, one of the uh, side benefits of, of living through what we're going through now in, in terms of learning, um, we're, we're looking at more of a personalized learning approach and, and as opposed to the traditional, if you're, in if you're 10 years old, you're in fourth grade, uh, more, more competency-based. And, and competency-based will take the students where they are and, and teach them the competencies that they need to be successful to go on to the next learning level, not necessarily grade level. That's a, that's a big shift for um, schools. It's a different way of organizing instruction, a different way of grouping students. And, and I think with uh, remote learning uh, and with uh, using technology, um, we're, we can blend that into the, that way of thinking much easier than uh, arbitrarily getting a group of 10 year olds and assuming they're all at the same place. And they aren't and they never have been and never will be. And, and, and so it's a different way of thinking about teaching and learning. Uh, also at, at some levels, uh, more choice for students. Um, and, and that's really key because they know what they're interested in. They know what they wanna study, particularly the older they get. And, and so if we can have that uh, as, as an offshoot uh, for more personalized instruction, that will be a benefit as well. Good to hear, good to hear. Superintendent Schwartz, what's the plan in Avondale for those students who, who are more advanced for their grade or who have maybe fallen a little bit behind because of the COVID pandemic? So again, we look at that as, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, it's a personalized approach, much like, you know, what, uh, what Jerry is, is indicating in West Bloomfield. Uh, we, we do, you know, a series of assessments the data gathering on an individual student, and then we provide the necessary accommodations for that child. Uh, if they're above, below, uh, you know, we, we will do you know, a series of acceleration uh, depending on the area that they need to be accelerated in and remediation based on where they need to be remediated. Uh, and so we have resources you know, throughout the continuum uh, that will allow us to, to adapt to those uh, on a grade level basis, on a school basis, um, you know, we have a, a pretty uh, robust gifted and talented program you know, for students that would be eligible for that. Uh, and, um, and likewise, you know, down to, uh, you know, the remediation of things. So really it's, it's a case by case basis and it's all dependent upon the individual data that is coming from that individual child. Good to hear, good to hear. Again, it's another one of those, we'll see how things go and see where the kids are at. Um, yep. To, to, to figure that one out. Okay, we actually have a follow-up to our transportation question. So I'm gonna start with Superintendent Williams again. Have you been in talks with the SMART busing program to maybe uh, bus kids to and from school? No, we have not uh, thus far. We are currently working with our transportation provider um, to outline what needs uh, we will have as far as what resources they can provide. So no, we have not reached out to SMART thus far. Superintendent Hill, has there been any conversation with uh, the SMART bus system? Uh, no, with, with all the lakes in West Bloomfield, uh, SMART bus would have to be really smart to figure out all the routes. Um, <laughs> That's a good point, didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent Schwarz, any conversation with the smart bus? No, no, not at this time. And I don't even know that they service this area um, for I us. I didn't so. think so. But yeah. I, saw, I, saw, I saw a couple of people were asking, so I thought I would yeah. put it in there. Okay, just getting our next question pulled up here. Hold on. This is for Superintendent Williams. In the Pontiac School District, is there a point person or possibly a point group organizations who want to assist the school district can contact? Yes, uh, Heidi Headquest, which is our PR coordinator. Um, she's been coordinating all of our volunteers as well as um, she 
is on our Facebook page. So she has all of her information there. Um, I've also included it in the chat room, um, her email address. Good to hear. Superintendent Hill, if someone wants to help out in West Bloomfield, is there anyone in particular they should reach out to? Yeah, and I'll put it in the chat. It's Daniel Durkin, uh, daniel.durkin at wbsd.org. He's our uh, public relations and community relations uh, liaison, and then he will uh, direct people to the, the right resource and, and or direct us to them. So he would be the person. Good to hear. Superintendent Schwarz, is there a particular person you could direct people to? Absolutely. So her name is Annette McAvoy, and she's our, our communications director. Uh, and likewise, she will direct those questions to the appropriate departments and, and people necessary. Uh, that would be Annette.com. McAvoy, M-C-A-V-O-Y, at evandaleschools.org. We have another transportation follow-up question here. I'm going to start with Superintendent Williams. Has there been any thought to using technology assistance or possibility-based thinking to come up with solutions to the transportation problem? Not at this time. No. Superintendent Hill? Uh, any thought of using technology to maybe help you out with your transportation issue or possibilities-based thinking? Well, we will. The transportation company we use, um, they they have a, a routing software. I'm sure most uh, transportation companies have that, and, and so we'll be utilizing that. And we, what we need to do is, uh, if, if we register, if people sign up for the transportation service, then we can be more efficient on on creating those routes. So, so that would be. The, the technology involved. Superintendent Schwarz, any technology-based analysis or possibilities thinking that Avondale is looking at for helping out with the transportation problem? Yeah, it's much the same. With our transportation software, you know, we design that as, you know, dependent upon enrollment, where kids are coming from. Uh, that's, that's the piece of technology that, that we utilize. So when we get the survey data from parents on who actually is going to utilize transportation, uh, that will help us tremendously in how we organize those routes. That's the same for Pontiac as well, the polyplot. Yeah. Wonderful, good to hear. Now this next question I think is very interesting. I'm gonna start with Superintendent Williams. How might working from home inform the future of work and subsequent K-12 instruction? So how can we prepare kids for maybe working at home and also working with parents who might be working from home? Well, I'm gonna be quite transparent. Um, we would like for our students to return back to uh, schools with face-to-face -face learning. Um, we have found that research shows that 90% um, of students learn better with our face-to-face -face, um, settings. And so we don't want to take the option away from our students nor our parents, but we do encourage that our students return back to school. So um, we have not put a lot of um, thought in the vision of you know, going remote totally, but um, we do want to make sure that we provide the opportunities for our students to return back to school for the face-to-face. -face. Good to hear, it's definitely not about Placing or keeping kids at home. It's we right. want to make sure that they can still interact with their peers, school, still talk with their their educators, and and still get that quality education while being prepared for Absolutely. a future that might involve more working from home in the post pandemic uh, era. Superintendent Hill, I've got a good one here for you. What is the planned first day of school? Uh, for the 2020-2021 school year? Well, we, we changed ours to a pre-Labor Day start. We're going to be starting with our instruction on August the 25th. Good to hear. Superintendent Williams, when is your first day going to be? We're starting uh, the first Tuesday after uh, Labor Day. And Superintendent Schwarz, when's your first day? We are starting prior to Labor Day. We're starting on September 1st. <clears throat> Good to hear. Okay, we're going to go back to Superintendent Williams. This person is thinking ahead. In their opinion, in your opinion, what kind of school supplies would be useful for students 
one, that are distance or remote online learning. Uh, and then two, while they're in person, will anyone use their own supplies instead of community supplies? As has been a more recent thing in the community. Right. right. Um, we're open for students to use their, their own supplies if, if parents feel comfortable. It's all about making sure that who we are servicing is, is comfortable with uh, the process. And so we will have the supplies. A lot of our partners um, give us supplies every year. We normally have a back to school rally. Unfortunately, we did have to cancel it. But we, we welcome um, paper, pencils, um, we will probably need additional uh, PPE around gloves and masks. So those are the type of things now that we have to begin to think about as we talk about supplies. It's not just the paper, pencil, um, notebooks. We, we now need to talk about the PPE gear, which is going to uh, heavily impact our budgets. And so if um, our partners or, or our volunteers want to help in that capacity, that's our shifting and paradigm shift in our mindset now to address the COVID-19 and the safety precautionary measures that we will be broaching. And uh, Rep Carter's office does have coloring books, superintendents. We have three we different always, coloring books. We love the coloring <laughs> books, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Superintendent Hill, uh, are there any particular supplies that students may need for uh, remote learning or while they're back in the classroom? Uh, Superintendent Williams mentioned that PPE, will parents need to supply these or will the school have them? Uh, we're looking to purchase PPE for use in school, um, but we're, we're under no illusions that uh, we'll have to have excess supplies uh, more than we anticipate we need. I think somebody mentioned earlier, I like the idea of, of having masks on the buses, for example, and um, that, that would be critical. Um, in terms of supplies for learners, uh, our school board made a decision the other day. We were fortunate that we had a bond issue that passed in 2017 and we accelerated the purchase of Chromebooks. And so our students will not be transporting Chromebooks back and forth. They'll have a Chromebook for home and, and another uh, Chromebook for in the class. And so that's a huge uh, a benefit. They don't have to carry them back and forth and, and that they'll be able to use their, their own Chromebooks and, um, and that way, if, if, if they, there, there's no excuse. I mean, they, they have them and they'll, they'll be there. We get a lot of creative students in terms of, I forgot my Chromebook. Uh, we're trying to put a, a stop to that. Um, the, the other, really, I think this is an equity issue across the state and it's the hotspots or Wi-Fi accessibility. Um, in, in West Bloomfield, we had a little over 10% or so of our students' homes who did not have uh, hotspots or Wi-Fi connections that we provided those. Uh, and, and so we're, we're looking for some uh, assistance at the state level uh, and maybe some partnerships through AT&T or other providers for hotspots for families uh, that are educationally used and, and not uh, costly. Uh, so that would be a huge benefit for the state to take a look at in providing um, Wi-Fi access for all the homes. It's definitely a conversation I've been hearing around Lansing. Yeah. Uh, Superintendent Schwarz has what uh, supplies would Avondale suggest for their remote learning students or their in-person students and what supplies can the school supply and what supplies will parents have to supply? So we intend on supplying, you know, what students need in terms of their academic materials, art materials, all of those things. You know, one of the interesting things is that we've always taught our children to share. And now we're gonna be in a paradigm where we're gonna tell kid, we're telling kids not to share. Uh, they're gonna have their own materials and be instructed to only use and take care of their own materials as opposed to sharing those materials. Um, so uh, we fully intend on, on supplying those. Uh, in terms of donations from parents, again, we always are asking for uh, any additions to, you know, the traditional, you know, paper markers, pencils, Kleenex, uh, Clorox wipes, those would be extremely helpful for classrooms. Um, you know, those are things that typically on an ordinary year we ask for, and I, I will think even more so on this year just to help us to have a steady supply uh, of those. The PPE materials that, uh, that uh, uh, Superintendent Williams had indicated, you know, certainly that'll be something that it We'll be looking, I mean, we'll have enough for students, but donations will always help keep us fully stocked as well. Uh, and 
uh, as Superintendent Hill had indicated about devices, um, you know, we do have devices. Unfortunately, we have devices that students will have to take back and forth uh, because we don't have an adequate number of devices so that they can have one at home and at school. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly students having their own device would be a great thing um, for parents to buy for their child. Uh, so they have one of their own. Um, and then the hotspots continues to be an issue and that's an issue statewide. And there's portions of our district that are affected by that uh, uh, inaccessibility uh, concern uh, that needs to be remediated from a state perspective. Thank you. I'm gonna try to squeeze one more question here under the wire. We're getting very close to five o'clock, but it's definitely an important question. Uh, Superintendent Williams, what is Pontiac's plan B if we do get that second wave come the fall? <sighs> yes, we, uh, we have talked about it and we all fear that second wave. And unfortunately we will have to go back to what we are now experiencing with our students, which will be the uh, remote learning at home. And um, one thing is we're prepared for it this time and the uh, equipment is in place and the transition would go a lot smoother than initially. So um, we've talked about it and that would be the return to our uh, um, current continuity uh, plan as it relates to learning from home. Superintendent Hill, what's the plan in West Bloomfield if we do get hit with a second wave in the fall? Yeah, unfortunately, we have to uh, plan for the worst and hope for the best. And, and so what, what we're doing is our, our Lakers Online our totally remote program would be implemented for everybody in that case. I, I would just encourage all of our families uh, to abide by the uh, stay safe measures, uh, the social distancing, wearing face masks, wash your hands and, and try not to just exercise good judgment so we don't get to that second wave. It's very tempting to get tired of this uh, pandemic restrictions, but I'd rather have the inconvenience of a mask and having to wash my hands frequently than uh, to have a second wave. And, and I, I just just challenge our all of our listeners to uh, take that same approach. And it's for the safety of everyone uh, and, and for the benefit of students. Definitely, absolutely. It's all about wearing your mask, washing your hands, socially distance as, as possible uh, now that things are opening back up. But uh, Superintendent Schwartz, what's the plan in Avondale if there is that second wave? Yeah, if, if, if we should happen to slip into a second wave, you know, we are prepared to you know, fall rather immediately into a, you know, a refined remote mode. Um, so similar to what we've been in, in this, this, um, this period that we've just been through, uh, but with the refinements uh, on platforms and on uh, asynchronous learning, uh, you know, those types of things we would uh, shore up on. But our staff is, is uh, they're ready at a moment's notice to slip in, into that mode uh, should they need to again. You know, and unfortunately, we don't have to. I mean, again, if folks will abide by taking the precautions that have been illustrated earlier, you know, hopefully that does not happen here in Michigan, so. Thank you, it's uh, definitely a conversation that needs to be had and it's good to hear that our schools are preparing for that second wave. Um, we are right at uh, about 4.58 here. Superintendent Williams, do you have any closing remarks? I just want to thank um, State Rep Carter, yourself for facilitating this town hall. Um, it's been very important for us to get the message out to help our uh, community as well as our parents understand what we are going to be embarking upon as we open up the 2021 school year. And so uh, feedback and uh, suggestions we welcome here. And so uh, we don't know it all because there are so many unknowns and, it, and it's fluid right now. But um, I do, I must say that Oakland County superintendents have worked collectively together to ensure that we are doing the best possible plans for our students in the upcoming school year. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. Do you have any closing remarks for our viewers? I wanna echo what uh, Superintendent Williams just said. First, thank you to uh, Representative Brenda Carter for hosting this and to you, Jonathan, for, for your master of ceremonies uh, of, the, of the question. <laughs> 
Uh, also, I want to emphasize um, the, the role that Oakland Schools is playing in, in helping all of the school districts, all 28 of us in Oakland County, to uh, both learn from each other, uh, to provide collective uh, knowledge and strategies and resources. And, and it's, it's good to, to know that we have colleagues we can go to uh, for problems and questions and problem solving and things that are beyond uh, what we're thinking about at the time, but it's, it's really important. And, and lastly, I, I want to thank our, our teachers. They've done yeoman's work through this since March, and they're just amazing in terms of how they adapted. And, and it just points out how special teachers are. Uh, and, and the parents, I think, have a greater appreciation for teachers uh, than they had in the past. It's not an easy job. As my son tells me with his uh, eight-year-old and six-year-old, like, I don't know how they do it. And I only have two. So, <laughs> so it, it's something that uh, the teachers need to be proud of themselves for their work. We can't thank our teachers enough. They, they definitely don't get enough credit for what they do. Yeah, um, Superintendent Schwarz, do you have any last remarks? So, yeah, again, you know, our, our teachers are the real heroes of, of, of this situation. Uh, you know, they were... Uh, they had to basically change their, their entire mode of operation and their, their paradigms of thinking overnight, literally. Uh, and, you know, they've done a yeoman's job at, uh, uh, at, at commanding the, the situation uh, and delivering, you know, the best of instruction under the circumstances. Um, and they were eager, uh, passionate. Uh, they were very concerned for their students. Uh, not just academically, but also for their well-being. Uh, and, you know, they, outside of, of doing, you know, direct instruction, they were also doing wellness checks uh, and they were spending countless hours in reach outs to families. Uh, and they've gone over and above uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the degree of, of, of contact to, to uh, families. And so I, I commend our teachers for how they've handled this the situation because it really did turn their world upside down uh, overnight, uh, and they were able to turn it right back, right side up, and and move forward confidently uh, and, and making the best of the situation for everyone. So, um, and I suspect that will be the same attitude that they confront the fall with, whatever the obstacles are that we we come across in the fall. So, um, it certainly has added a, a new dimension of teaching that. Uh, Folks never, never really thought about until this happened. So, uh, so our, our uh, certainly our, our congratulations and thanks go out to uh, to our teachers. So, and, well, and again, I, from uh, from an Oakland Schools perspective, I echo my colleagues in terms of the degree of of camaraderie and uh, connectivity between each other. We're all looking at moving forward, uh, you know, very similarly in the county uh, because of that collaboration. Uh, and so I, I certainly thank my colleagues for uh, their keen advice and wisdom as, as, as we all approach these obstacles together. We're definitely in this in a, as a team effort. I would like to thank each of our wonderful panelists here, your input and uh, what the explanations we've been getting are just very important. It's good for people to hear. Uh, thank you to Civic Center TV. They have been broadcasting. Now, if we didn't get to your question, or maybe you're catching a recording of this after the fact, you can always email State Representative Brenda Carter's office at brendacarter at house.mgov. Or you can call us at 517-373-0475, and we can definitely send your question to whichever superintendent, or maybe all three, if you'd like to hear about the different policies in the districts. Um, so don't just don't think that we can't get you an answer to your question just because we weren't able to get to it right now. But uh, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to our teachers, our parents, our students. Everyone's just working so hard to make life as normal as possible during this COVID pandemic. And I hope you all have a have a great evening. Thank you.